Welcome to part three in a three-part YouTube series, Preparing for Disasters. Today, we're gonna to look at other considerations, extreme situations, and resources. So, some basic other considerations that you should keep in mind when you're preparing for both man-made and natural disasters is an energy source, and I typically recommend a tri-fuel generator, which takes propane, and gas, and you can get them with a couple other third fuel options, radiation detectors, chemical detection tape. Other considerations also include becoming the gray man, and what that means is that you don't want to go fully tricked out in all mill gear walking through an area uh, that people may need a lot of stuff because they're going to see you as somebody who is prepared and may have some necessities. Nuclear detonations and fallout, one of our next slides will go into that. Prepackaged emergency food supplies. Barterable items including food, water, silver, gold, or other essentials. Electromagnetic pulses, we've got a slide on that. Fiat currency versus money. Water prep and purification. Water storage, farming basics, and we've got a slide on that a little bit later. New, nutritional long-term food storage, solar generators, and the benefit of a solar generator is that it's quiet versus a fuel generator, uh, so you won't draw as much attention to yourself. The trade-off is that you typically cannot generate much power with these solar generators without a pretty big setup. Types of quality backpacks, defensive weapon types, medical training and books to buy, what would happen if there was riot, rioting and looting close to you? Alarms and cameras, both solar and battery operated and hardwired. Whole house generators. And again, I, I think the, um, the best one to get is going to be a, if you have gas available, it's a natural gas whole house generator. Trash disposal, latrine locations, natural and herbal medicine. Fake news and false flags. Uh, we seem to get a lot of news today from social media, friends and family, and we unfortunately don't have a perfect way to filter it and discern what's actually going on in the world. So that's normally why I prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, it's called defensive pessimism, and, and uh, so I have a lot of plans and plays to uh, at, at least get through the first few days of almost anything that happens. Communication devices, um, handheld radios, and the Depending on the size and the power you buy, they're not going to get very far, but they could get you up and down the street, maybe a few blocks away. And then obviously shortwave radio is going to get you a lot further, and that may be the best way to keep in touch with folks if we do actually have a, a grid down situation or if power is out for an extended period of time. Medical supplies, we reviewed in the previous video some medical supplies to, to stock in the house, both in your bug out bag and bug in bags, candles and crank lights and radios. I have candles, crank lights, uh, and crank radios. Um, you can buy the long term, like six day candles uh, from, uh, from Amazon or some other source. Iodine tablets, um, I like iodine tablets. Uh, you can uh, use those if you, are, if you suspect that there's some radiation uh, in place somewhere. Water purification tablets, that's you basically just drop those into canteens or in gallons of water. Soap, shampoo, and female needs. This is, uh, I always kind of joke around that the first thing that's going to go by the wayside in any major disaster is sanitation. And that's because if you think about it briefly, what are we all going to do with our trash? You know, the, we're still going to be generating a decent amount of trash. Nobody's going to be there to pick it up. In addition to that, your toilets aren't going to work. Um, you're not going to have running water. Uh, you probably didn't stock two or three bottles of shampoo, soap, uh, deodorant, feminine hygiene products, or, or, or these things. And so sanitation is going to be one of the first uh, casualties of a disaster in, in my mind. So plan accordingly. Open fire cooking and propane grills. One of the other things that you read a lot of, a lot about in disaster situations is because we are not at this juncture in our civilization used to dealing with a lot of open fire inside our house or around our house daily that there's going to be 
uh, the propensity to set things on fire, burn your house down, start major fires, uh, these types of things, because we're just not used to the the safety procedures needed to have these these uh, open flames for light and for heat. So again, plan accordingly. Condiments. I know that I don't want the uh, SHTF or a long term disaster without my uh, my mustard and ketchup. So I've I've actually planned accordingly there. Compass needed. I'm a big fan of having a compass. You got to know where. North is south, east, and west in case you want to head in a specific direction. So, for instance, we're in Austin, and if I wanted to get up to, say, Colleen Copper's Cove or Waco or even head further north to Dallas, uh, at least, at the very least, I'd be walking in the right direction if I didn't have some paper maps. And then again, no police, ambulance, or fire response. That's why it's important to have the, the medicine uh, that your family needs on site. It's important to have some medical supplies. It's important to have some type of defensive weapon. And of course, it's extremely important to be careful around open flames. Survival books and resources. A little bit further in this video, I list a, um, a books that I think are worthwhile to purchase ahead of time. And then Faraday boxes or pouches and those specifically guard against EMP blast or CMEs, the coronal mass ejections that the sun puts off, and it would basically save small items. You can actually get, you know, safes, full-size safes, gun safes that are EMP proof uh, via mil spec, um, via the manufacturer. You can buy Faraday boxes and pouches off of Amazon. You can actually get some combination fireproof slash Faraday pouches. Uh, that I store some stuff in, important papers and backup cell phones, stuff like that. Uh, all, there, you know, and look, I, I get that this is a lot to think about and a lot to prepare for, but but realistically, you're not doing all of this week one or, or month one. If you start and just go through the lists, the bug out bag list, the bug in bag list, some of these other considerations, and just start slowly working on these things. One of the secrets. Um, that I would tell you to accumulating a lot of this stuff uh, is going to garage sales or estate sales, but garage sales more than anything, you could probably get, I don't know, 20%, 30% of what you're going to need in uh, disaster via, via garage sales. Certainly tents, backpacks, uh, clothing, uh, flashlights, um, you know, all kind of stuff like that you can get at garage sales really, really cheaply. I still, to this day, even though I have all all this stuff, plus or minus, I still hit garage sales almost weekly to look for uh, kit upgrades, equipment upgrades. So now we're going to talk about extreme situations. And these are the things that I think are a little bit far right, a little bit far left, but could still potentially happen. And you just need to, you know, if, if you can't prepare for all of these, you at least want to have heard something about them. Um, to, to see what you may need. And so dirty bombs, dirty bombs are typically uh, considered, you know, some type of bomb that's got some radiation or some type of other chemical in it that's going to uh, adversely affect the population. Tactical nuclear bombs, chemical spills, and there's been numerous uh, chemical spills in the U.S. this year, 2023. Terrorist attacks, and those could be large or small, could be a terrorist attack on a um, electrical station to shut down the grid, or it could be terrorist attacks on railways, train stations, buses, riots, which are actually, uh, I hate to say common in America right now, but we've certainly had our, our, uh, our, our riots going on the last few years, um, biological and chemical attacks. And I like the chemical tape that you can buy um, from you know different folks online that in the military we used it we basically just taped it to the outs outside of our mop suits and that would alert us uh, to any chemicals in the air biological attacks and that could be any number of things um, hyperinflation of the currency we hear a lot of talk about these uh, this happening in different countries obviously it's happened in uh, in a in a few countries recently I believe Lebanon and uh, Venezuela are the most recent, uh, but uh, but it goes as far back as Weimar Republic in Germany. Germany, and um, it, it, that's really interesting reading and really interesting um, photos come out of the hyperinflated currency when you when you see these folks walking around with wheelbarrows of money and. 
the the common links in a hyper inflated society is that um, obviously food prices go through the roof. Food becomes um, extremely valuable. Um, gold and silver uh, actually maintains their values. And so a lot of arguments that people want to have about um, keeping lots of currency out of out of the bank, a lot of your dollars out of the bank. Look, I agree with that. I think you should have ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds. Um, absolutely outside of the banking system. Absolutely somewhere you can put your hands on. But I also believe that you need to have gold, silver, food, and you know maybe ammunition, maybe some other barterable items uh, that that you can trade. Uh, should uh, should you be in a, a long time disaster. And then extreme reduction in food supplies, famine, and more. And obviously we've been the uh, world's been in and out of famines. Uh, we've got. God, I think right now we've got China hoarding rice. We've got uh, grain deals falling apart in the Ukraine. And um, we've also got what's supposed to be the repeat of the Dust Bowl uh, in America coming soon, which is a, um, uh, a once every 80 to 100 year uh, heat wave that's supposed to be kicking back off pretty soon. The, the name of it escapes me. And so let's spend a moment talking about our nuclear bomb being detonated over Austin, Texas. And this is a really cool um, website. You can actually get this app for your phone as well. It's nukemap, nuclearsecrecy.com. And what I did here was basically detonate a nine, uh, nine megaton warhead over Austin. And I did an airburst. Um, and what you'll notice when you do this is, and in, in, in the way this is color-coded is the very center where you see the, the word Austin, that's the fireball radius. And basically anything in that area, if you read it, is effectively vaporized. And that's obviously if they dropped it almost directly on top of downtown. And this is an airburst, not a ground um, blast and the airburst typically will do a little bit more damage. And then the green is the radiation. Heavy blast radius of 20 psi uh, is is the red. It's a little bit harder to see. And then the moderate blast damage of 5 psi is the gray. And we'll, we've got a couple slides kind of explaining what that means to you. But you'll see the estimated fatalities at 473,000 um, almost immediately and estimated injuries 500,000 and I live actually northwest Austin so for instance um, I live in, in uh, where is it at I live this is 183 it's actually a little bit hard to see All right, okay here's 620 so I live in this area uh, but you can see the damage the thermal radiation third degree burns is getting all the way out to this area. And so people that live in North Cedar Park or Leander, um, they're going to have a light damage blast of one PSI. And all the way east going into the outskirts of Maine or close to Elgin, um, if you know where the Tesla factory is down here, um, Bee Caves, Lakeway, beautiful area down 620 here at the lake. This is going to be a lot of damage here, and um, if you're inside, so much the better. If you're in this 5 PSI um, damage radius, uh, you're going to see what happens next. And one of the other things that this software does, which I really like, is it, it lets you see what radioactive fallout is going to do based on wind direction, uh, and time and if you spend some time on this you will understand that you know as you get into the um, greater than 800 rads um, in radiation it's it's basically death and, and you start getting into very high 600 800 is high low with aggressive therapy um, 200 to 600 and what you'll see is the contours for 1,000 rads, 100 rads per hour. That means that you've got repeated exposure that starts to accumulate. And so 
you need to pay attention to this. It's extremely important to know if you're downwind or upwind from a nuclear bat blast and how long to stay in your house once a nuclear blast or bomb would go off. And you can get really, really, really inexpensive radiation meters, um, $150, $200. And they, some of these actually will keep track of total accumu accumulated radiation versus just a quick independent measurement. So lots of sources for those online. And so what I wanted to talk about is what does 5 PSI do? And it's extremely important to understand that 5 PSI does not sound like a lot, but but look at this. It's 163 miles per hour, maximum wind speed. Most buildings will collapse and injuries are universal. Fatalities are widespread. So if you go back to this and you see where the 5 PSI radius is through here, that's what we're talking about. So going all the way up to, you know, parts of Maine are getting into uh, I-35 Pflugerville, um, right off of 183 and 360, off Sunset Valley, heading south towards Manshack, towards 1626. Um, 5 PSI is actually pretty bad. And so um, 1 PSI, and this is going to be the biggest radius, uh, you're still going to shatter windows. And then if you look at the 20 PSI radius, you're talking about heavily built concrete buildings or severely damaged or demolished, demolished and fatalities approach 100%. So we're not just talking about heat. We're not just talking about radiation. We're talking about physical pressure in the air from the blast. And this is equal to a category five hurricane just so you know, 5 PSI. So let's talk about electromagnetic pulses. And these typically occur when you detonate a nuclear bomb in the atmosphere. And depending on the megaton, kiloton of the nuclear bomb, um, that will determine how much distance exposure you get with an EMP. And nothing is obviously um, in, in, in stone with this because we, we, nobody that I know has detonated a nuclear bomb in the atmosphere to get it large anyway, megaton, you know, 5, 10, 20 megaton bomb in the atmosphere to see how far the actual EMP damage goes because that would destroy uh, just about everything in there that was electronic. And again, we talk about Faraday cages, Faraday pouches. Um, that's how you can protect uh, in the electronics that you have, I definitely suggest you have at least one or two backup cell phones in there, uh, maybe with some documents, some pictures, um, you know, pictures of passports, directions to get somewhere. And again, those phones are going to work as long as you have a way to charge them. And uh, it's extremely important to talk about charging. And again, if you bought a, an EMP proof safe, that'd be really the best way in my mind to go for small items because you could put chargers in there, you could put phones. You can put radios, laptops, uh, anything like that. And again, I've got references of where you can get some more information on these. The other thing that can produce an uh, electromagnetic pulse is uh, a coronal mass ejection. And you can Google that and get familiar with it. But it's basically where the sun is throwing out the, the same type of damaging pulse and there's been lots of fears that the sun, uh, solar flares, and some of these other things would uh, would do the same to us. We've, if you just Google it, you'll see some, some items in the news. Additional resources. So these are the books that I think you should purchase or at least have on hand. And again, if you download them digitally and you have them on a phone and you have them in an EMP-proof safe or Faraday pouch or box, then you'll actually have access to it. I much prefer paper. Uh, because uh, I guess old school, I want to circle stuff, highlight stuff. I'm going to put sticky notes in there so that I can get to things that I think are important quickly. Um, the SAS Survival Book, Emergency, this book will save your life. Prepper's Blueprint, Bushcraft 101, Modern Survival Manual, Survival Medicine Handbook. I think absolutely need to get that one. 
uh, building the perfect bug out bag, deep survival, who lives, who dies, and why, the forager's harvest, complete idiot's guide to urban homesteading, when all hell breaks loose, stuff you need to survive when disaster strikes, where there is no doctor, again, medical, um, encyclopedia of country living, disaster preparedness, handbook, and nuclear war survival skills. Kind of the biggest fear that you should probably have is getting a scratch outside and getting infected and then somebody passing away because you didn't know how to treat it, uh, to disinfect it, antibiotics, or anything of, of that nature. And that a lot, of, most of that stuff, if not all of it's going to be covered in these books. Here's some online resources. And again, these online resources are wonderful if we've got internet and wonderful if you've got a phone or laptop that works. So again, suggestion is to go into these, these, uh, these online sources and download and print as much as you can if you find it valuable. And there's a lot of valuable information on these web websites. Here's some visuals. I included a lot of visuals because a lot of the stuff that we've been reviewing is just text, a few visuals. And so I want to talk a little bit about each one of these. So top left, we've got a map, and this is a nice map to get you around. I like the laminated maps better than waterproof maps, which you can order online. We've got a compass. We've talked a little bit about compasses. Uh, we've got a survival kit that's waterproof. One of the things you don't want to do is get out and have to walk somewhere and it rain on you and ruin half of, or not, if not all, your supplies. Uh, top middle is a survival kit. You can get these on Amazon, again, from any number of survival stores. Uh, top right, same thing. This one has medical supplies in it. Survival kits, and I like these because there's going to be things in it you didn't even think about getting, but are in the kit. And so um, it's, a, it's a quick way to knock out a bunch of the stuff that you would need in a bug out bag. Um, bottom center, what I like about this photo is that these folks don't look like they prepared for the end of the world or for, you know, an SHTF event that's, that's uh, lasting a long time. And so this is going in line with that gray man uh, philosophy, meaning you don't stick out. If you saw these folks walking around, you would not assume that they are, um, that, that they're going to be some, somebody worth looting. Whereas the guy on the right, if he shows up walking around, you're going to be like, obviously that guy's got good kit and I want what he's got. Top left, hand crank radio and flashlight and charger. A small solar panel that is not going to get you a lot of power via the sun. Um, sunblock, I hate to say this, but gosh, do people forget about sunblock. If you're going to be out walking in the sun for any length of time, assume, you know, potentially you have some children or elderly with you, you need to get sunblock on everybody ASAP. Mosquito nets, top center. If you've ever sat, if you've had the luxury of sitting in a foxhole at night, either on drills or in a, in a, war zone in an area that had mosquitoes, you will understand the, you understand the complete misery of having bugs bite you all night. And the same thing, you'll see the kind of bottom left insect repellent and um, mosquito netting is extremely important. Fire starters, why not um, buy them? You can make them, but if you can buy them now, why not? Uh, portable water, this is your water purification tablets, bottom left, fire starter. Uh, center and then just an emergency tent and then potassium iodide, which is your um, tablets that you would use for radiation. Uh, whenever there's a radiation event anywhere near you, there's there are some uh, directions on how to use those on the bottles. Multi-tool, why not? Life straw, which is water purification. Again, this is a small water purification item. They actually make whole house water purification purification systems, Berkey systems, and typically the life straws, they will get you by in a pinch, but you really want to do, um, you know, boil the water. And, you, you know, a lot of the folks will recommend a three, four, five stage uh, uh, water filter. And obviously that's best if you have it. If you just have to hit the road and go in your bug out bag, you're not carrying a big Berkey with you. You are going to have a life straw and this will get you by in a pinch. Uh, survival knife, Top right, again, just kind of, this is just a picture of what some guy's bug out bag may look like. And I can't emphasize enough getting comfortable shoes. Uh, running shoes are nice if you're going to be walking down the road for, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles. But if you're crossing any type of terrain, you really need to put on some boots, not some low top boots, but high top boots. And one of the worst things you can do is 
buy some boots at a store that are going to work for a situation like this and then never wear them. And the first time you wear them, you're getting blisters, your feet are not used to them or they're not what you thought they were. So, so important concept in prepping is to make sure that you actually train and use the equipment that you're going to be taking with you. The worst thing in the world that could happen to you is you get a thousand dollar bug out bag and 50% of the items in the bag are just complete trash or break on the first day. So make sure you train with the uh, the equipment that you're buying or any of the items that you're buying. If you're not going to train with them, at least, at the very least, uh, read some reviews from some credible sources online, some camping folks or just somebody. Just don't take everything for granted just because it's shiny. Bottom left is just some camo gear. Um, you know, if you can get some of this stuff, why not? Uh, um, and then the bottom right is a millispec backpack. Uh, and this would not be in line with the gray man philosophy, but unfortunately, I think just the mill spec backpacks, God, they do so much. They're so strong. Um, they've got all the right pouches in the right places for the most part. They're just hard to get away from. And they actually started selling mill spec backpacks in grays, blues, greens, purples, golds, pinks uh, for this specific situation because they don't want you to stand out. And so... It'll look like a child's backpack, but it's actually mill spec. And again, last thing you want to do is hit the road or hit the woods or have to, you know, hike two or three days and have a cheap backpack that's falling apart the the first day you're going to use it. So I would definitely look for mill spec or look for something that at the very least has some tremendously good reviews from people that have actually used it in situations. I like uh, top left. I like. Uh, these types of vests because they they carry so much and you can get really organized and so if you if you went to my house I have one of these ready that I can really just throw on and, and roll out um, with different stuff in it. and we'll talk about that uh, in a later video um, but I like I like the idea of having these and I like the idea of everybody in the family having one that's uh, basically loaded and ready to go and I'm not talking about firearms ammunition all that just general survival stuff is is more than good enough. Um, if you've got uh, children or folks around you that uh, you know shouldn't be around, shouldn't be around uh, weapons. Important to know which plants can kill you. Um, that's part of the reason that I think you should buy books and keep the books and don't experiment. Um, hurricane prep. One of the things that you can research that has a lot of good information, similar to what we're talking about, is you know, people in the hurricane preparation states like Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, there's always a bunch of good information you can put your hands on. And that's basically what you're doing, because in a hurricane, uh, you know, again, if you've been through one, typically powers out for a few days, waters out for a few days. Um, we're expecting things to get back to normal, um, you know, within you know, three to five days, maybe seven. But, but they have a lot of good resources. And I would definitely recommend doing some research on hurricane prep and then just uh, moving that over to uh, disaster prep and, and generic disaster prep. Bottom left is clothes. Uh, I live in the south, so um, we don't have that many days of cold weather. But if you lived up north, obviously you can you can you can die from the temperatures up there and the uh, the weather. So you want to have something prepared. I would, it's going to be pretty hard to do a winter bug out bag and a summer bug out bag. So just put the clothes, put everything you need in the bug the generic bug out bag and if you are bugging out during the summer and it's 100 degrees outside and you don't need the, uh, the the heavy stuff, just tie it to the back of the bag. Use it as potential, uh, you know, rain gear or whatever you need to cover some other stuff. Again, a couple more books on survival, and then uh, bottom right is you know basically hazmat chem warfare gear. Um, again, you can buy this stuff. You know, they they sell this to the civilian world. Um, and you can get it actually for children. I've never seen infant hazmat chemical warfare gear. I have seen children's uh, gear. I've seen obviously adult gear, uh, but just do the research online. Just make sure it's a credible company that you're buying it from. If you've got the money, I'm going to say why not? Because as long as you take care of this stuff and you store it in the right place and you're not out partying in it, uh, this stuff will last forever. You know, you, you, the important thing is to keep it, um, keep the temperature. Uh, you know, plus or minus 73 degrees and just keep it somewhere safe and it should last you just about forever. You, you, again, you don't want to 
you don't want to whip this out at the moment you need it and not know how to use it. So I'm going to predicate uh, the purchase of this with, hey, if you're going to be committed to actually trying it on and getting it set up and getting your family to, even if you make it kind of a fun day to try out this stuff and it's a pizza party or whatever it's going to be, you need to try this stuff before you actually need it because at that point, uh, more than likely, it's going to be too late, especially if you don't know where you put it or you can't put your hands on it or your your family or friends don't know how to use the equipment. Uh, survival farming. So this is like really long-term disaster preparation here. Like none of us are going to be into survival farming if we go without, you know, food and water for a couple weeks or really even a month. Hats off to the people that are already doing this um, for sure. I think it's, uh, it's, it's much better than not. But, but for the most part, people living in the suburbs and the city are not doing survival farming. Um, but I do suggest that you actually buy a couple books on this or at least download and print some stuff so that you do know what you can do and, and what different types of foods it takes to, uh, to, to flourish. And you can always buy cheap seeds at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever your local nursery is and just replenish them every now and then. But seeds are not expensive. Uh, guys, I really want to tell you thank you if you've sat through this entire video. Don't forget to subscribe and like. Leave comments below. Uh, we focus on preparing financially, physically, mentally for life's challenges. Uh, we do do some disaster prep. We do financial planning, uh, physical and mental preparation. And, and again, it's basically defensive pessimism. I'm assuming the worst. My life has been good. Everything is good in my life. I do a lot of research on these, these subjects because I, I don't want things to go completely south should the world sour in some way for either a short or long period of time. This is really just in my mind, an intelligent way to sleep at night, uh, better knowing that you've got some preps uh, to fall back on. So again, thank you very much. My name is Danny Weber. Uh, please like the video and subscribe to our channel, and I will see you soon.